Good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to this seminar that has been organised uh, by the Political Quarterly Journal. So I'm Dr Kate Dummett and I'm going to be chairing the event today. And just to introduce this workshop, this um, event is the culmination of a piece of work that I organised last year in partnership with the Political Quarterly Journal. You might have already seen the special issue of the journal that is out right now and if not then do have a look on the website because it, all the articles have been made freely available for you to have a look at. So last year when we could actually physically meet we held a workshop in Parliament hosted by the House of Lords Committee on Democracy and Digital Technology to gather together a group of academics, regulators and social media companies to discuss the challenge of digital campaigning and it's a really critical but yet as unrealistic as yet unresolved issue about how are we going to regulate digital campaigning and how are we going to achieve um, change in this space. This is so important because our electoral system was designed in the pre-digital era and as yet hasn't been updated to reflect the rise of technology. But there's an ongoing question about how we can change the system. So we're incredibly lucky today to have a three excellent panellists who are going to speak about, uh, firstly Helen's going to speak about the um, special issue and then we're very lucky to have two experts in this space. So before I introduce them in detail, just to kind of run you through the ground rules of the event. So the chat feature is disabled for attendees. So if you've got a question, then we're asking for you to submit that in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We're not going to be asking attendees to turn on your camera. So uh, if you write a question, if we have a cluster of questions, then either I'll rephrase them and pose them to the panel, or we may come to you and ask you to ask your question um, just through audio, not through video. We've got a Twitter hashtag for this event, which is hashtag digital campaigning. So we'd encourage you to, to tweet your thoughts. And if you have any questions about the event, then please engage online on Twitter. And we're also going to be recording this webinar and making it available on our website. So you can rewatch this at your leisure after the event. So hopefully that provides a, a bit of a um, ground rules for how this is going to work. Now in terms of the format, we've got three speakers, as I mentioned. Um, they're each going to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. And we're going to have a brief panel discussion and then open up to questions. So you do start thinking about those questions as each speaker speaks. Um, first up, we've got Professor Helen Margetts, who's Professor of Society and the Internet at the University of Oxford, and also Director of Public Policy at the Alan Turing Institute. And Helen's going to provide an overview of the recent special issue and um, specifically speak to the recommendations that she made in one of the articles. Then we've got our second speaker, Louise Edwards, who is Director of Regulation at the Electoral Commission. And um, that's one of the bodies that is charged with regulating elections in this space to hear her perspective. And finally, we're going to hear from Damien Collins MP, who as Chair of the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, oversaw the inquiry into disinformation and fake news. So as I said, each of our speakers will speak for about 10 minutes um, and do please use the Q&A function to pose your questions. So to kick off, let's dive right in. So I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Helen Margetts, who's going to speak for between 10 to 15 minutes. So Helen, over to you. Hello, th thank you, Kate, and uh, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I'm going to start just by saying a couple of things about social media. Um, just because in a session about digital campaigning, the regulation and oversight of digital campaigning, we are inevitably going to spend a lot of the session being very critical of social media um, and possibly critical of the regulation of it. Um, and I wanted just to say a, a couple of positive things to kick off with. Um, I think there is enough evidence by now to suggest that the social media have bought positive things to politics, positive things to political debate. They have made engagement and participation easier. They have facilitated widespread in, uh, mobilization and action, just at a time when political commentators were saying we'd all sort of given up on, on politics. They, there is a sense in which social media have taken the hands, uh, have taken politics out of the hands of a kind of activist elite and involved more ordinary people in politics. They've generated widespread interest in involvement, particularly amongst the young, the 
particular people that we we tend to think are not interested in in politics it's also where young people and people of all ages um, get their news get their information so it's a vitally uh, that's what we're preserve talking about preserving here um, we're trying to that that's the prize if you like and it's a prize prize kind of worth worth preserving. And the other thing I wanted to say is that social media have really only been around in UK elections anyway for about 10 years. That's really, that's a long time in internet time, um, but it's not a long time in the grand scheme of things. And it's not surprising that our legal and regulatory system for elections needs updating um, and to accommodate this kind of big shift where we've all moved online. So I just wanted to start with those two kind of positive uh, points, if you like. However, there is a clear and urgent need for um, a kind of overhaul of our regulation and oversight of digital campaigning. I guess there's three, we'll, we'll talk about lots of things, but there's three areas in particular. One is the question of hate speech, abuse, harassment, of, um, uh, of people in the political and public sphere more generally. Secondly, there's the question of misinformation, either misinformation about specific political or public policy issues or misinformation about elections themselves and where to go and vote, the most basic sort of uh, uh, administration of elections. And then there's the question of highly, um, highly targeted political advertising, which seems to have um, kind of evolved in a more or less unchecked way. And all those issues go beyond the kind of just online. We, we know that um, we see it outside elections in the pandemic, for example, where misinformation about, um, uh, about miracle cures for COVID-19 or misinformation about vaccination um, are, are, is rife on social media and leads to real physical um, harm and to the recovery from the pandemic. Um, in the US, we saw how misinformation about the election results um, spreading um, in vast quantities online led to real offline harm, abuse, and, and even, even death. So um, we're talking about something really important here, both in the positive sense and in the highly negative sense. Um, what I will say, as Kate said, is kind of our, um, our kind of conclusions, if you like, of the special section, but that drew together all the papers in the issue. They go into these issues in more depth. So do have a look at the um, special issue or the special section. Um, of an issue. And in that last piece, we, we kind of, um, we, we target our recommendations at different actors in the political system. So the first one um, that we, uh, the first recommendation that we make is about government. It's about, we call for a whole scale rewriting of electoral law, which as Kate pointed to, has really not been up, 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 up updated at any point during the kind of social media era. There's key kind of definitions that our legal system is based on, which just don't work anymore. Digital campaigning used to be a thing that, uh, campaigning is regarded as something that takes place in the election period. But now we are seeing digital campaigning right throughout um, uh, right throughout in between elections. Um, and that's one way in which we don't cope, it, cope with it well in, in, within the legal system. What's a political party? Um, we've seen massive sort of permeability between pressure groups, political parties. We've seen kind of campaigns like um, uh, both for, for, for um, uh, the uh, for, for, for leaving and remaining um, in the uh, European Union sort of morph into political parties, um, seemingly as if they came from nowhere. Of course, they, they, they didn't. Um, now, in the middle of a global pandemic, um, it's rather unlikely that we're going to get a whole scale rewriting of electoral law. It's not going to be um, the priority right now. But I still think there is a case for prioritizing many of the issues that we raise there. 
Um, for example, uh, there is a new online harms white paper. There is going to be um, uh, legislation in that in, in, in that direction. The white paper was um, announced in December. Um, it does mention both hate and misinformation in elections. Is there a, it, it nominates Ofcom as the chief uh, regulator in this area. Is there a possibility there that some kind of provision for elections can be uh, written into that? Um, legislation. Um, so there's definitely actions for government, there's actions, um, in, 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 there, there is action for, 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 for legislation in this area and it needs to come uh, at, at some point as soon as it possibly can. Um, a second set of actors um, are the platforms themselves and they are of course the ones with the most capacity um, for change in the, um, in, in the short term. They have made changes. It's always too little, it's always too late, um, but they have made changes. The mainstream platforms have introduced transparency reports. We do know more about the kind of data that they're um, collecting and the kind of pathologies that they are, that are taking place on their platforms, that are taken down from their platforms, the number of accounts that are blocked and, and so on. But it's very, it's not very systematized. The, platform, the platforms are doing different things. They're basically telling us what they want to tell us. And we, we don't have a kind of regulatory mechanism for ensuring um, that, that, that they're telling, what, telling us what we need to know. There is a welcome development in that they've started to introduce kind of when we think about content moderation on social media, it tends to be quite a binary a thing, or at least that's how it's traditionally been thought of. Something's either there or it's not. An account is blocked or it's not blocked. It's a, a piece of content is up or it's down. The social media platforms have started to think about that in a more nuanced way. They've introduced friction so that some things are less searchable or they, they don't come to the top of search results, for example, or they're more difficult to share. They've started to put warnings on, 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 on things. We saw Trump's Twitter feed during the US elections looking like a, a cigarette packet by the end. Um, so they are starting to do things like that, um, particularly during election periods in, in, in some countries, and that is something to think about. But again, there, it needs systematizing. So Twitter took the final kind of act um, in the last few days of the Trump presidency and they took Trump's account down. But the key, and, and I think perhaps the majority of people agree, well, actually people don't agree about that, but I mean, a lot of people, including myself, think that was the right thing to do. Um, and they did it supposedly because he broke their code of conduct which it, uh, which it did, but of course had been doing so for a long time. The point is that they decided when to take it down and we need more, uh, more control over, as a, as a kind of political system, if you like, more control over um, when that decision is made and when it isn't made and to know more about how it's made. Um, so that leads me on to a third set of actors, which is regulators. Um, regulators have a really difficult job here. And this doesn't just apply to elections, it applies to almost every kind of market or area of society, if you like, because um, they are dealing with the technology titans um, of the world. Um, and it's almost impossible for them to have the kind of state of art technology they would need to deal with this in a technological way. Um, so they, they need to work through these kind of mechanisms that I was just talking about, codes of conduct, community standards, transparency reports. These need to be scrutinized. They need to be transparent. They need to be scrutinized. They need to be reformed. And of course, they need to be regulated. And we need lots more attention in that direction. They also need to work together on specific issues. If you think of... Um, uh, the, the issue of political advertising, for example, that has been passed around between um, regulators um, like a sort of political hot potato. Um, nobody wants, no one regulator wants it to be their responsibility. 
Um, there has been a recommendation from the House of Lords Committee, um, and we make this, a similar recommendation here that there should be a regulatory liaison committees where regulators get together and tackle that issue together, uh, uh, together in concert. We have seen uh, regulators getting um, uh, together in other, uh, in other areas. For example, there is um, AI in regulation working group set up by the Information Commissioner's Office all regulators are, are facing challenges in this area and working together and developing sort of common ways of dealing with things um, can, uh, can really help. Then um, the fourth set of actors that we talk about in the paper are non-governmental organisations, kind of civil society. And here, to some extent, I think you're, you're talking about the unsung heroes in a way of this, in this area, because NGOs like Tell Mama and Hope Not Hate and, 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 and so on, fact-checking organisations, um, public uh, service journalism organisations, all these organisations keep up a sort of continual stream of public awareness. Um, they, uh, they monitor what's going on. They draw sort of new emerging issues to people's attention. They do qualitative research on kind of trends and um, kind of worrying developments. Um, and also there's a role for regulators here as well in terms of public awareness um, uh, campaigns that involve citizens and offers some kind of um, citizenship education, which takes account of the technological environment um, and includes things like digital literacy and media literacy as, as, as well as other aspects of citizen um, education. You could argue that you can't understand um, politics or participate in politics very easily these days unless you do have some understanding of the information environment and social media um, and so on. Um, and I guess that's where I would end is with, with two things. One is that there's a role for researchers here as well. Um, I expect that among the audience there are researchers. I'm a, I'm a researcher. And I do feel that in this area, it's, it's, it's one where perhaps as the research community hasn't necessarily served um, policymakers so well. And there are lots of opportunities um, to work together. This is a highly technical area. As I said, expecting um, regulators to kind of um, keep one step, step ahead of Google and Facebook and Twitter and, and, or, or something is, is really a lot to ask. But the research community, both on the technical side, on, on building machine learning classifiers and so on, and on the social science side here, it, understanding these sort of pathological phenomena and the impact they have on citizens um, can kind of come together to help regulators in that area. We're working on that at the Turing on a big report on, on common capacity in AI. For, for regulators. Um, so I think that's where I'd end is a message that all these actors need to work together to tackle these issues. Otherwise, um, the technology giants are going to carry on driving the agenda into the future. Thanks. Thank you so much, Helen. That was an uh, excellent overview. And you know, do go onto the Political Quarterly uh, website and you can download um, those papers for free and review them at your leisure. So now I'm exceptionally pleased to introduce Louise Edwards, who is Director of Regulation at the Electoral Commission and has been leading some really important work at that regulator. So Louise, hand over to you for around 10 minutes. Thank you for that very nice introduction and thank you also for inviting me to take part in this event and to have the chance to share the Commission's views. We always welcome opportunities to talk about the importance of digital transparency and it's really good to see the continued interest in this area and new additions happening to this conversation all the time. We're really pleased to see so many of the Commission's long-standing calls reflected in the papers in the journal as well, so thank you for that. Now, the Electoral Commission monitors and enforces the political finance rules. They are the ones that are meant to provide voters with transparency about the money spent and the money received by campaigners and parties in the UK. On our website, for example, you can find thousands of lines of funding and spending data, all searchable by parties and by campaigns, by electoral events as well. So when it comes to digital campaigning, our primary objective is to make sure that UK voters know who is paying to target them online during elections and referendums. 
Now, in the 20 years since the Electoral Commission was established, we've obviously seen the political campaigning landscape change beyond recognition. And most of that is by the development of online tools. But as we all know, and has already been mentioned, electoral law and the regulatory regime that it creates have failed to keep up. Let me spend a minute defining how we see the challenge here. And then I'll talk about what we see as some of the solutions, many of which are touched on in the articles in the journal. Firstly, and importantly, I'm gonna echo Helen a little bit here and just start off by saying that we should remember that political digital campaigning can be a force for good for parties, for candidates, for, ca for campaigners, and really importantly for voters as well. Democracy depends on parties and campaigners being able to communicate with voters and online campaigning can be a great way to do this. And let's remember, it's likely to take on an even greater importance in the run up to this year's polls, given the public health background. But we at the Commission had long signaled our concerns that these tools risk being overshadowed by concerns about truth, transparency and the targeting of online political ads. And this is borne out by the evidence. Our voter research following the December 2019 general election, for example, showed a real drop in public confidence and growing apprehension about the way that campaigning is conducted, particularly online. We found that 60% of people did not think that the information online about politics was trustworthy. We found that nearly half of people said they couldn't find out who had produced information they saw online. And nearly half again were concerned about why and how political ads were targeted at them. Now our research provides just a snapshot of the problem, but it does indicate the depth of public unease. It's worrying and it undermines those positives which I mentioned earlier. So what are the solutions? Well, we agree that this is a question that doesn't have a single answer or a single owner. To ensure voter confidence in digital campaigning and sufficient oversight, we think that governments, parties, campaigners, social media companies and regulators need to work together. Now, there have been signs of progress from the UK's government, and we do welcome the steps that have already been taken in this area. Now, for example, in Scotland, imprints on digital campaigning material are now a legal requirement. Digital imprints are required at an election in the UK. Now, during this campaign, which will be the first time that these laws have been enforced, we see our role very much as working to promote understanding of them and to promote compliance with this new law, and also to monitor its effectiveness in delivering the changes for transparency that voters want. And we're also pleased that the UK government has consulted on the technical details of a proposed digital imprint regime. So we do support the progress that the UK government is making in this area, although we have outlined a number of ways in which the regime could be even more transparent. And these are important steps, but there is more that can be done by the UK's government, as the articles rightly argue. Let me start with what we think are some of the key areas for legislative change, such as requiring parties and campaigners to provide more information to voters on the money being spent on online campaigning, and I'll come back to that. Strengthening our ability to get the information that we need to establish whether the rules have been broken, or indeed if they haven't been and also incentivizing parties and campaigners to build really strong compliance teams within their organizations by increasing the penalties that we can impose if the law is broken. These specific actions should take place against the backdrop of a more long-term and comprehensive modernization of electoral law by the UK's governments, from paper nomination forms to inadequate financial reporting requirements, our system is very much out of date. But it's not just governments that can bring about change. I will come to this mention some of the other groups that are outlined in the recommendations. But before that, I'd like to talk about one group that's not singled out for recommendations. And that's parties and campaigners. After all, who is ultimately responsible for the content and targeting of digital campaigning? Those doing the campaigning. So given the growing concerns about the content and veracity of online campaigning, there is a heightened need for the campaigners and the parties themselves to take greater responsibility for the kind of campaigns they run, to think about the impact of their activities on public confidence in elections. Now, while many already voluntarily include an imprint on digital material, not all do. Not all those imprints are terribly visible. Voters aren't always clear who a website or a Twitter feed belongs to. Now, these are choices that campaigners can make now without any changes to the law. 
Social media companies clearly have an important role too. Many have taken the welcome steps mentioned already to ensure we can see who is paying to place adverts. But these actions are hindered by inconsistencies in the criteria used to decide what counts as political advertising and differences in the granularity of the data that's provided. We believe the law should specify the amount and type of information that social media companies have to give voters and regulators. Indeed, the companies themselves have said, wouldn't they, that they welcome clear and consistent requirements in this area. The report also rightly concludes that we regulators have a role to play. The Commission has a good working relationship and engages in cross-regulator groups, um, but we do also see the opportunities that closer cooperation could bring. Now, we're working to build on our existing levels of, in of engagement and, crucially, on our ability to share information with other regulators as well. For example, in the run-up to this year's elections, we are talking with a group of other regulators about how we can make sure that we learn the lessons from the campaign. It's a fairly unusual situation and a welcome one this time. Um, that we have scheduled polls that we can plan for in advance, and we want to take advantage of that with our learning. We're also increasing our efforts to help members of the public navigate the world of democracy and of digital campaigning. We believe it's really important to get people engaged in democracy from a young age, because if voters are interested early on, there's an increased chance they will be engaged and active voters for their entire lives. We've started working with the newly enfranchised groups so that they understand the importance of using their vote. A few months ago, we launched a Welcome to Your Vote campaign in Scotland and Wales, for example, which includes political literacy resources. These are for young people and for educators to help them understand how the voting system will work in their area. The tools are intended to support teachers and students to feel more comfortable and knowledgeable when talking about political campaigning. And more specifically, when it comes to helping the public to navigate political information and advertising online, the Commission is running a new public awareness campaign ahead of this year's elections that aims to encourage people to think more carefully about the campaign material that they see online. We want people to feel confident about digital campaigning, to understand who is trying to reach them and why, and to know how to take action if they see something that concerns them. Our campaign will direct people to our website where they'll be able to get information about our work and also that of other reg relevant regulators. So where does this take us? We know that delivering transparency in digital campaigning won't be straightforward or sudden, but many of the proposals that we've discussed today already and those we will come on to discuss bring us closer to making it a reality. And yes, it's going to require commitment and action from governments, parties, campaigners, social media companies and the regulator community. But it's worth doing. Our democratic system needs to be fit for the 21st century. It needs to command the confidence of the public. And that's why we are ready to help try and deliver these changes. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Louise. That was fascinating. And uh, I might pick up that comment about trust in the, in the discussion in a second. I think that's a really interesting uh, conundrum that we face as people trying to bring about change in this area. So uh, finally, I'm going to hand over to Damien Collins, um, who is similarly going to speak for around 10 minutes. So Damien, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kate. It's really great to be with you all. The, this is a really big issue. And I think as we've got, as we've gone along over the last couple of years, I think we've recognized new aspects of what the challenge of regulating uh, election campaigning through social media and online. And I think the, the number of issues to be addressed have grown as a consequence of that. When, we, when you go back, strip it all back, election campaigning is basically the same as it's been for over a hundred years, which is you, Take your, make your arguments in public, um, you seek to identify your supporters, and then on, on election day, you seek to turn them out to vote. And th those, have, those principles have been the same since, we, you know, since, since the start of election era. What makes today different, what makes social media so different from other innovations we've seen before, is the challenge it throws down for both transparency and accountability over how we campaign. 
in terms of transparency, it is much easier on social media to hide who you are, to contact and, uh, and reach out to millions of voters in a way which is not necessarily transparent. And we've seen um, over the last couple of years, several occasions in this country where there have been major campaigns run, not by political parties, uh, but by campaign groups that have suddenly emerged, that are suddenly spending a lot of money targeting people. And we don't really know and find it quite difficult to know who's behind them. You know, we've seen um, in America and to, to a lesser extent here, but certainly across Europe, we've seen campaigning done by campaign groups that are based in another country, or that are being operated by Russian campaigners and operatives targeting voters in another country in a way which is actually in breach of our election law. So there's a lot of inauthentic uh, activity going on uh, and activity where people are trying to make sure there is no real accountability for what's being done. The other thing that we've done in the past is make sure that there is a degree of fairness in the way people use new media and technology. With, you know, in the UK, we don't allow uh, broadcast advertising um, on radio and television in political campaigns. But in America, where they do, from the very early, early days, and particularly with, uh, with radio advertising, the Federal Communications Commission was set up in the 1930s, and amongst its jobs was to make sure that radio stations didn't sell airtime preferential rates uh, to the particular candidates, that everyone had access to that media uh, at a fixed rate in order to use it. Uh, there were controls over stopping the development of monopolies and too much foreign ownership in radio, which could affect political speech. That was regarded as being important. And, and many of those rules also translated into the television era as well. But with it, with, in terms of advertising in newspapers, a newspaper editor is just as responsible for the adverts that appear in their newspaper as they are for copy. Um, uh, an, a false allegation made in print could lead to legal action being taken against an individual or indeed if it was misleading information and leaflets and, and so on put through people's doors, then that's something the Electoral Commission would investigate. It's much harder to do those things if you don't know who's doing them. If that, if that, if that, link, of, if that link for transparency is no longer there and it's easy to trace who is doing it and why and why they're doing it so you can take action against them also there are these various different media in the past have had certain gatekeepers there is the jeopardy to the party a political party for misrepresenting its views or the views of, uh, of others in its own campaigns um, newspaper editors or news editors or program editors would take responsible decisions on how they reported the actions of different candidates uh, and different players but yet that doesn't happen on on social media in the same way. And that makes it much easier to do what we've seen this year, particularly we saw in America since the American presidential election, which is not so much for people to post information which may be, may be wrong and dishonest or, uh, or there's no transparency of who the campaigner is, but to flood the zone with information to with, through, through multiple linked and connected accounts to try and distort and, sh and shape what millions of people uh, hear, and, hear and see. And that's, that provides an altogether much bigger challenge for us to say, well, how do, we, how do we help the citizen navigate their way through this? And what are the rules of this type of campaigning? What should be permissible and not? And when it comes to the responsibility of the tech companies, what do we want them to do to act when we can't see what's going on, when they can see uh, maybe a campaign that looks inauthentic or being run from overseas in breach of election law, um, we need their help to help us determine what should we be investigating, what should we be looking at, what looks suspicious and we should intervene on. So I'm sure we'll talk about a lot of these things during the course of this discussion. But there are some, I think, particular things we need to, need to look at. Firstly, I think we absolutely need to have imprints as standards on, on political adverts. Um, that is something that we call for on the Select Committee report, the Electoral Commission have called for. Uh, I think we're now on about our third government consultation on this. Now that, that is one of the sort of basic standards we should have in place. I think as well there should be an obligation placed on the, the, social, on the, on the tech companies to report suspicious activity as well. So in the case of the famous case of the Russian adverts targeting American voters in 2016, I think there should be an obligation on, on a social media company where if they can see ads being bought in one country to target people in another, and that's a breach of the law in that country to campaign in that way, that a flag is raised uh, on that. Or indeed, indeed, there's an attempt to block that at the, point, at the point it happens. I think if people are making online donations through, um, through payment services like PayPal to political parties, 
I think the default settings of, of those tools should change so that if it's a political donation to a registered political party, then you should have to reveal at least which country uh, you're based in at the moment the transaction is made. There are no real obligations on, on tech companies to, to, to put those sorts of checks in place to try and make it harder for people to do the wrong thing. I think um, some of the reforms that Facebook put in place in the last year or so were a step in the right direction. I think having ad libraries is important to try and end the phenomenon of of campaigners running dark ads, which can only be seen by the people that receive them. and can't be, be more widely looked at, so you can't see actually what people are talking about in a campaign, what issues they're trying to push. Um, and I think having, you know, creating higher standards for identification and verification of who someone is before they can place an ad. I think those are important reforms, but it's still easy to get around a, a, lot, of these, a lot of these systems. And indeed in America, just before the um, presidential election, the uh, many political groups redesignated themselves as uh, news organizations in order to get around the restrictions on political advertising in the final weeks of the campaign. So I think there need to be clearer rules there on who can advertise uh, on social media during an election campaign, uh, what they have to demonstrate, what information they have to give and provide in order to be allowed to do that, and what action the company should do to restrict others' uh, advertising during, I think particularly during the short period. I think what, what we want to see is high standards so that if someone is spending money to target voters using online tools, that, the, that we know who they are and we know where the money's coming from uh, and we know who those ads are there to support. And I think there's no particular requirement to provide that sort of information. The companies, I think, I've got, I've got to recognise that just as a newspaper editor has a liability for the ads that they run, if a company is, is receiving money, in order to, for, to allow its systems to be used to promote a political message, then I think the companies do have a responsibility there and they should, I think, have to intervene if it can be demonstrated someone is spreading malicious or false information uh, using their, their ad tools because they're at that point making money out of it. And uh, I think this, this, this uh, it, can, it cannot be right that someone could sp willfully spread information and target disinformation at voters in an election. Uh, but be uh, immune from any kind of intervention being taken against them simply because they're using an ad tool to do it. That's something I think we need to look at. And as the, the issue, issues like the growth of the use of deep fake technology in politics um, comes, which I think will come, I think the only, thing, the only reason we've not seen more of it so far is because the, the price of entry is probably a bit too high, but the people, uh, those costs of producing uh, realistic material that is fabricated um, and could be used maliciously for political purposes. Um, when that happens, and we know it's happening, I think we're going to want uh, a requirement that the social media companies act, uh, that they act against that, and not that they just say, well, we're neutral and it's got nothing to do with us. If their systems are being used to target people with that sort of content, then there should be some sort of power uh, that we have or, or regulators have in order to require that they make an intervention there. I mean, the, I think there's just a final thing I'd mention at this point is you know ad targeting which is which is which is very different through social media than it's ever been before in the amount of data that can be used to target people and particularly inferred data i know elizabeth Dellen, the information commissioner has raised this and i think it's, it's an important point which is that under gdpr there are certain protected characteristics in terms of data and one of them is people's political beliefs if a voter has has decided not to reveal what their political affiliation is when asked um, then and not to put, not to share it on their social media profile. Um, is it right that the social media company can guess what their political affiliation is and sell that information to a campaign organisation so that they can be targeted targeted with ads? Um, you know, that is that is the use of inferred data in that way appropriate or not? Uh, and is it even legal? Um, and I, I think the the rules that have been created around the way ad tools work on social media in order to sell music and shoes and clothes and other things like that are not necessarily appropriate for selling political ideas and political campaigns. So I think as part, as part of looking at the reform and guidelines to political advertising on social media, we should look at um, the way those ad tools work, particularly on platforms like Facebook, where the use of inferred data about people to see who else they are like uh, is, a really, is really key to how they work. And it's the reason why so much money has been diverted into campaigning in that way, because it's potentially so powerful, but it could also mean that people's data is being used in a way they wouldn't give consent to. So those are some of the issues I think for me um, need to be part of this wider review. Thank you so much, Damien. Um, again, absolutely fantastic. And I think so much food for thought. So 
before we kind of open to um, question and answers from participants, I'm going to have a bit of a discussion amongst the panel to a few questions that are, I'm going to pose to you. And I suppose the first one is perhaps a tricky one, but there have been a lot of recommendations over recent years in terms of the changes that need to be made to digital campaigning. And it feels like there are two areas where we are seeing progress made, and that's around digital imprints and around um, tackling misinformation and with the online harms, um, moving to get companies to have to take action um, to tackle misinformation. But we've heard from your kind of comments today and also the contributions that have been made in the special issue that there are a whole nother, a whole array of other types of recommendation. And I think that poses challenges for people who are trying to bring about change in this space because they're almost you know, too many targets. So my first kind of question to the panel is, you know, what's the next big issue to raise and to try and get change on? You know, is there one specific area or one specific policy change that you think should be the next thing that the government should move to implement? So I don't know if, uh, if Louise, that's something that you want to come in on to start with. Happy to. Um, I think the ultimate thing that we would like to see is the one next big change is the overall modernization of electoral law. Um, and that sounds like a huge big piece of work, but actually a lot of work has already been done in this area. Uh, the UK's law commissions, for example, have already looked at this and done a comprehensive package of recommendations to modernise electoral law. And if these were implemented by the UK's governments, I think that would bring real benefits for candidates, campaigners, those who run elections as well, electoral administrators and, and voters as well. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it may sound like a sort of big sweeping answer, but for me, it is that wholesale look at the law and bring it up to date. Damien, how about you? Do you want to jump in? Um, yes, I mean, obviously, I think bring the bring the law up to date. So we're at least translating into the, the rules that apply online, the rules that apply offline. So imprints is part of that because we have it in other forms of campaigning. I think the issue around donations is really important as well. I think it is far too easy to effectively launder money in small micro donations to a political campaign with each donation being up below, below the permissible level being done at scale to transfer a lot of money in that way. And I think if we think campaign finance is important, I think we should look at the way campaign finance rules apply uh, in through through online payment platforms. And then the, the other thing I'd say, just building on what I said before, is I think the rules on micro-targeting of voters and the use of the use of data and the use of on Facebook tools like lookalike audiences, where you take the profiles of a group of people that you that you know you might be based on their age, location, and, uh, and political interests, and you then look to find other people that map, that are a data match to them. Now in America, uh, actually globally now, YouTube has, uh, YouTube has a tool called Customer Match, which does that. YouTube have said that they're not gonna make that available anywhere for political campaigns. The Facebook tool called Lookalike Audiences is available. And I think there, this is an area where there should be some government guidance on this. So for me, I think to end some of this data profiling and micro-targeting of uh, ads, I think will be, you still, still target ads, but in, but in a much more general way, based on age and geography, um, uh, and, and, you know, maybe between uh, men and women. But I think to not to use data in a way it's been aggressively used so far. Mm, that's a really interesting point. And, and I think the issue of online political advertising and the lack of regulation there is certainly something that needs, needs addressing urgently. Helen, how about you from your perspective? Yeah, well, I, I don't want to be boring and agree with people, but I mean, I, I, I guess what I would highlight is just kind of, we are seeing movement in all sorts of areas, but actually sort of putting elections first, if you like, and kind of coalescing around this issue is something that I would see really important because I, I feel that the, there should be a kind of, a kind of possible win here, if you like. I mean, obviously, I do think that the companies actually do want regulation in this particular area because they've received such reputational damage from it in the past out of all proportion to the kind of money that, that they make out of politics. Because after all, what people are most interested in most of the time on social media is actually not politics, it's all the other stuff. Um, and so there is a potential kind of win here in that people's in incentives are aligned and if you think of I don't know take the Trump ban for example um, Twitter got a lot of criticism for that 
Trump ban on the basis that, I, I mean, there is a sense in which they're, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. Um, they normally get criticism for letting people kind of run all over social media, political figures run all over social media, and now they're getting criticism because they, they took one down because it was arbitrary. I mean, in, in, you know, it's, it's right that they should get criticism for kind of doing things in a non-transparent, arbitrary way. But what I'm trying to say is there is a real argument there to work. You can still, you can regulate and kind of collaborate. It is possible to do that. And I think we need to see more of that targeted at this particular issue. Always good to see a little bit of agreement amongst panelists who say, an excellent thing, not something to avoid. Um, so the other question that I have that might help open things up as well is, you know, we do have all of these recommendations and it does seem that there is a high degree of consensus. Um, so what do you think is the biggest barrier to the reform of digital campaigning? And particularly, how do you think that that barrier can be overcome? Helen, I don't know if you want to start on this one. Well, yeah, it is. Electoral regulation is all electoral change is is always difficult because the system is geared around sort of preserving this status quo. I, I, I think this is a problem. Um, and also, perhaps, I don't know, for an awfully long time, uh, social media were regarded completely Un unimportant to politics, you know, they just didn't matter. It was slicktivism, clacktivism, uh, clicktivism. Sorry, slacktivism, <laughs> clicktivism. It was it was something that sort of wasn't important and didn't matter. And then suddenly they went to being the most dangerous kind of um, uh, uh, thing ever. Um, in, you know, destroying political life, bringing the end of democracy. How many books have there been? of which the end of democracy forms, you know, a central part of the message. Um, and um, I, I think that does act as a, as, as a barrier. We don't think, I mean, you've heard here from a regulator and a politician, you know, really sensible, nuanced, um, kind of um, uh, thoughtful ways of tackling these problems. But we don't we don't see enough of, 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 of that. And, and I think that's what we have to kind of bring into the debate. You either see, oh, it doesn't. We've gone straight from it doesn't matter to it's all a disaster and democracy doesn't work anymore. We've got to try and, you know, um, get some rationality into the debate. Louise, I suppose this is a, an area in which the Electoral Commission has been making recommendations fairly frequently for, for quite a few years now. I suppose, do you have any thoughts on, you know, how, how this challenge to change it can be overcome? Yes, I think the first one is the sheer complexity of it, which isn't helpful, but it is a real factor. Um, and we've all identified different organisations, different types of organisations that would need to uh, change or think differently to have a real impact. And that is a challenge. When it comes to electoral law, it's a very prescriptive system. The way that elections are uh, legislated for in this country is to set really clear, quite strict rules around political parties and other forms of campaigning. And that also means that you have to be really careful about unintended consequences. You, know, you have to think about if you put further restrictions or requirements on people who want to campaign, will that have an impact then on people who want to campaign? And how do you make sure you strike that balance of ensuring that there's participation in democracy in this country, which is so hugely important, with also the real legitimate desire for transparency uh, and for more confidence in online political campaigning, which comes through in the sorts of survey work that we've done, for example. The other thing I've mentioned just really briefly, um, I mean, Damien mentioned sort of money laundering and, and money coming into political parties. And it's a really interesting area that he and I have actually discussed before. Um, which is that we do think uh, as the Commission that there is a role for some version of anti-money laundering regulations to be placed on political parties, those that you know, have a multi-million pound organisations basically. But there's an interesting comparison here because of course the anti-money laundering um, laws don't just apply to uh, the organisations that are receiving or giving money, but to the institutions that are facilitating that transaction as well, the financial institutions. And you can see a sort of parallel here to how you might think about regulations that attach to the social media companies 
as well as attaching to the parties and campaigners that are the ones actually using those services. Um, so there's some interesting sort of comparisons there about how you might think about the balance of where to place the recommendations and place the changes. Those are really interesting thoughts. Damien, I wonder if I can pick up on a question that's actually coming on the comments that kind of relates to this, which is, um, I, as the politician on, on the panel, you know, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts generally about what the barriers are, but if, if particularly you have thoughts about the role of politics in this and the willingness of politicians as the people using these tools to actually regulate in this space. I, I don't know if you want to make a contribution to this point. Yeah, so I think I think that the, the reason this has become difficult is actually because of the the, the nature of social media companies, uh, and I'll, I'll come on to explain what I mean about that. And that's why, because actually, some of the things we talk about are relatively straightforward to do. And indeed, if we made um, every political ad have a digital imprint on it, for, mo for the for the main political parties, it doesn't make much difference. Almost everything they do is branded, you know, um, so we we can see it's coming from them. Um, they, they have rules on what they spend and that relates to whatever the media is. Um, they, they are also regulated by, by the Electoral Commission and other bodies. So in terms of what they do, it wouldn't make a massive amount of difference. Um, as as I mean, I think Helen said, the, the, you know, for, for, the, for the social media companies themselves, the money they make from political advertising is not enormous. It's not a fundamental part of their, their business. I think having tighter regulations around that it wouldn't hurt, uh, wouldn't hurt them financially and would seem, seem achievable. The, the problems that, that we have, and if we look at the last last year, you can look at, I think, look at the um, the Stop the Steal movement in America that led to the, um, if you like, the insurrection on the 6th of January in Washington, people in the streets. And you look at the rise of conspiracy theory networks like QAnon, and you look at um, COVID conspiracies and anti-vaccine conspiracy theories, phenomenons of the last, last 12 months. Now, some of that is political campaigning, some of it is, some people say it's not, it's not linked to an election, it's just uh, people expressing a view and an opinion. Um, and some of it is using ad tools, some of it is not. Some of it is or the organic organization of people and accounts uh, on, on groups. And the, the challenges therefore the social media companies have found is that firstly, that sort of activity is not just about what you sell ads for and what, what the targeting tools are. It's about, do you make edit, do you make judgments on content? Do you say some content is good and some content is bad? Uh, and you know, that's something they've been very reluctant to do. Um, and also it then sort of suggests that they, they make editorial decisions on content, which they've always claimed they don't. And that somehow they're liable for what people do and say, which they dispute that they are. And so I think that's why they found it very difficult to act. But nevertheless, what we've seen in the last 12 months is they have undermined their own defense of saying they don't have a role here by making some of those decisions in extremists. So the decision to turn off Donald Trump's accounts it was, was made at a moment where it looked like there was, there's, there was an incitement for people to take to the streets. And then we'd seen a demonstration in Washington where five people died. And what was seen as an assault on democracy and a democratic process. The consequence of turning those accounts off is that, is that um, claims online, online that the election had been stolen uh, and there'd been a mass fraud, those, those declined by 70%. As a consequence of taking that decision and we know that people who are campaigning in that way no they understand the way in which you you make stuff go viral that it's not it's not a, it's not an accident there, there's a there's an architecture and design around it which which makes things go viral what it, it's almost like saying that if, imagine if every day that we had a uh, online poll to determine who should edit the 10 o'clock news um and every 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 day it was being won by the same organization that got the biggest number of people voting and therefore what you saw and what was broadcast was what they wanted all the time. That's sort of, for many people, that is what the news experience is like. And that is part of politics, as part of our debates as well. So there, there is part of this is regulating campaigning, which I think if you want to do it is relatively easy to do. And to amend our law to do it is something we could have done several years ago and we can do. There is a broader point around when you've got platforms through which most people now get their information. And the way they work is that their business model is designed that in, a, in an attention economy, it wants to hold your attention, those platforms want to hold your attention for as long as possible with whatever information will, will hold that attention, whether it's harmful or not, whether it's true or not, uh, whether it's encouraging you to disbelieve what politicians and public institutions and mainstream media say. If you're neutral to any of that uh, and, you, and you let that rip, then what you see is people burning 
mobile phone masks because they think they're spreading 5G and you see people taking to the streets in Washington because they think the election's been stolen, their votes have not been counted. And I think therefore there's, the, and this, why this is hard is that is a very big, you know, fundamental and philosophical question around the borders between free speech and responsibility, what responsibility the platforms have in this, in a world, in something that we've never really seen before, which is people getting most, people increasingly getting most of their news and information, including on politics, not from curated media, you know, curated by editors, but from an open pipe uh, that goes into the, goes into the, that goes into their homes every day. And how do we regulate that? And that, that's why, that's why this, what I'm talking about today is important, but it is part of that bigger debate we're having now. Yeah, that's a really excellent point. And I think yeah, this is it's a very, very complex issue, as Louisa was saying. It's, it's not easy to see a solution out of this because of that complexity. Um, I want to open up to some bullet questions in a second, but just before I do, I'll ask one more, which is coming back to the point that Louise made. So I think you, you know, you're mentioning that there's a real debate here around how do we raise the profile of this issue to the extent that we can bring about change and build the pressure for change whilst at the same time ensuring that we don't damage public trust. So, Louise, I wonder if you want to, to say anything further about, you know, do you think that we're getting the balance right here? Or do you think that, you know, as people pushing for regulatory change in this space, maybe we should be doing something differently about how we're building the case for change? An easy one then. Um, I think you have to look a little bit at the evidence on it. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, some of the survey work that we did after the 2019 general election that showed a really quite stark figures about how people were not trusting the political campaigning that they were seeing online. And that's a trend that we've seen over recent elections. Um, and we've had a few in recent years to get that data and to have a look at it. Um, so I, I almost feel that, that um, the risk of public trust falling as a result of this issue is more an issue than a risk. And actually talking about solutions is the right thing to be doing. Um, it's the right conversation to be having at this point. But I think also, I mentioned some of the public awareness work that the commission is doing. And I think that's another way to think about it as well. Um, you know, we have to think about the tools that currently exist to support voters. We may think those tools aren't quite there. We might think that they're not adequate, but they're what we've got at the moment and we should be encouraging voters to responsibly use them to try and build up their own confidence in what they can see at the moment because ultimately what we don't want to see is that voters don't listen to anything that's said to them online you know political parties i'm sure don't want that but actually i don't think that we want that as well we want democracy to continue that conversation to continue and this is a way that that conversation can continue um, so I think we are doing the right thing by having these discussions, by building the consensus that is being built about how these issues should be dealt with, by focusing on solutions. But let's also kind of try and build up people's confidence in the tools that they have now um, so that they can feel more confident about what they're seeing online in any election, be it this year or the next few years. Thank you, that's great. Damien, any thoughts on this one? Why must I unmute myself? Um, no, I agree with what what Louise has said. I think it is about public confidence. I think it's about giving. I think part of this as well is there's a big debate about regulate regulation. You know, regulation from through law and through the electoral commission, um, regulation perhaps of the social media companies through things like the online harms legislation. But there's a big part of this about giving giving people the tools that they need to help them sift through information that they they think they they can rely on or not. So make it easy for people to see why they've been targeted with an ad and who's targeting them. Make it easy to follow back to see, well, what else have those organisations said? Now, some of those tools are there. Some of them probably need a bit of help. With news organisations, you know, make it easier for people to see, does, you know, does this organisation look like a legitimate news organisation or is it, or should I be, should I question um, what I see? So I think that is, that's a really important part too. You know, for traditional media, those tools have been there for a long time and people, people know how to use them. But... Um, in the online environment, that that's harder, and I think that has to be. And I think, and I think, and I think that will also help public confidence too. And I, I, th I think things like I was talking to um, a company Adobe, who've developed a, a new tool which um, is used so that if you if you click on an image, the idea is you can click on an image, and it will tell you who created the image, if it's been edited, when it was edited, and who did it. And I th and I think if, if we move into an era where there's more fake imagery, fake films, deep fake films. 
how can we make it really easy for people to um, to spot them and encourage companies creating legitimate content for legitimate means to use those sorts of th th those sorts of technologies to make it easier for voters to to see you know what's behind the, the image so that they give them give them trust what they're seeing is uh, something they can um, that whether they agree with it or not they, they know is valid mm, that kind of transparency is vital Helen finally any comments on this well I agree with what the both the others have said, but I would just add, I mean, sometimes we do have to think about figures of for trust. I mean, polling figures for trust and, and so on are very, um, they're very difficult to interpret, um, always have been. Um, but there is a question here about kind of who people trust anyway. We've just done a piece of research on vulnerability to misinformation about COVID-19. Um, and what we found, what, what people were reporting is that they kind of, what they trust most are friends and family. Um, but the trouble is a lot of the misinformation on, on social media is spread by friends and family. Do, do you see what I mean? So sometimes I think we do have to distinguish between kind of the, the medium and the person who's who's giving the, the message. And, and yeah, and some of the distrust of, of political parties and political institutions it's because people don't you, you know they don't trust those they're not trusting those institutions anyway um so i think i think we can conflate issues here that need to be separated a bit so i'm now going to bring in sam power who is one of the contributors to the um special issue so sam is going to ask his question over audio i believe so sam if you're able to unmute and do you want to ask a question to the panel yeah, great. Thank you very much, um, Kate. And thanks very much to the panel. This is really, really interesting. Um, my, my question's a little bit similar, I suppose, to Kate's first one, but I suppose I, I want to bore down a little bit because I like to think of regulation, I suppose, or regulatory reform in this area as separated into three functional camps. One is, I suppose, the relatively easy fixes and reforms in both the political and practical sense. And we might, I suppose, see digital imprints, although it's taken, you know, it's, it's taking a while to get it over the line. It's at least somewhere close as that. And then you've got on the other end, perhaps what Louise was talking about, your more kind of large scale reforms, or indeed the reforms that you might get implemented if we were living in an ideal world where practicality wasn't a problem. And then something in the middle, perhaps a moderate reform. And I was wondering if the panel had any thoughts as to what reforms that they think of, of, uh, of the raft of reforms that we have kind of fit into those packets. So the kind of perhaps the easier fixes, the, um, the, the, the more, more large scale fixes, and then you reform somewhere in the middle that might be um, slightly more achievable than the um, long-term aims. Damien, do you want to, to kick off with that one, with a response to that? Oh, I'm not sure quite what's happened to the connection then. Louise, how about you? A, a response to that? Yes, it's an interesting way of breaking it down. Uh, I can see the logic in it. I think, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna slightly balk at the use of the word easy just because I believe my policy team back at the commission may shout at me if I make these things sound too easy. Um, but yes, things like imprints, there's a real logic there. We already have them on printed paper uh, materials. So you can see why that might work. Um, I would also add in there, for example, taking the existing definition of election material or campaign material, which exists in law already and could therefore be easily applied online and would deal with some of those consistency points, which I talked about with the way that the ad libraries work. So large scale ideal reforms, I will come back to my mantra about sort of electoral law generally. But I would also just mention what I did before, that a lot of work has already been done in this area by the UK's law commissions. So you would not be starting from scratch should the UK's government decide that they wanted to take that up. The moderate reform one, that's very interesting. And I think there'd be a lot of disagreement and discussion about what falls into that category. I personally would add in there powers that might help us as the regulator uh, to help regulate this area, powers like us being able to get information out of social media companies and others with more easy 
um, access to requirement powers or being able to incentivize compliance by having higher fining powers if people break the law. Um, those are areas which I think would obviously require debate and discussion and parliamentary approval before they could go through. So they're not easy fixes in that sense, um, but would I think make a real difference to what we as one of the regulators in this area will be able to do and hopefully therefore our ability to instill confidence in voters that this area is regulated. Thank you, Louise. That was a really great response. So we're starting to get an awful lot of questions come in. So I'm going to, to move on to ask some of the others. And we've had quite a few questions come in that are focused around the role of news and where news and media companies fit into this. So to pick one, um, the Public Interest News Foundation has said, after the 2016 referendum, The Sun claimed that its campaign had swung voters in favour of Brexit. Where do news publishers sit in the future regulatory regime for political campaigns? And there's also been a couple of others that, that pick up this idea of, you know, how do the media fit into this context of broader regulation? Um, so I don't know if Damien or Helen, either of you want to come in, Damien? Sure. Well, I mean, with, um, with newspapers, on the whole, well, the newspapers are partisan. They, they adopt positions and they campaign on issues. And on the whole, their readers understand where they stand. And often in election campaigns, the paper will come out for a political a party or a candidate. The newspapers are, have their own self-regulatory system and ultimately they are accountable to the courts as well if they, if they do something which is, you know, um, if they defame a candidate or, or, or an organisation then they face jeopardy from doing that. Broadcasters are already regulated by Ofcom, so there are, there are structures in place there. I think what we're talking about here, which is different online, is that you can have organisations where it's difficult to know who they are, it's difficult to know where they are or how they're being run and organized. And it would be questionable whether they indeed they are even legitimate news organizations. Um, and bodies, the, the bodies like that, that, that are often some of the most egregious spreaders of you know, wanton disinformation are ones that should give us cause for concern. So in the online harms proposals, the government said there will be a carve out for news organizations. What there has to be within that is a very clear definition in that case what, of what a news organization is. But clearly some broadcast media are already regulated, but what about print, what we used to call print organizations, but could be an online news organization that uh, could, be, could be someone who is really a, a spreader of disinformation, but is actually saying, well, no, I'm a news provider and therefore you know, I should be exempt from the regulations as well. So I think that's, that's one of the challenges there is to have a clear definition of what a news organization is and recognize that most traditional media already has, is already, if you're a broadcaster, you're already regulated. If you're a news organization, if you're a print news organization, then there are other bodies you're accountable to because ultimately you, know, you put your name on what you do and the editor is responsible for, for what goes out. So that's why I think this is a, this is a new challenge. You know, people will dispute what news organizations say and they'll get things wrong. Um, and indeed, as broadcasters do as well. And the, the role of the regulators is to determine you know, what action should be taken when something does go wrong, or what redress there should be. Um, on, on, in, the, in the social media environment, that doesn't quite exist in the same way because the platforms have said, well, we're not particularly responsible uh, and it can be hard to identify who's doing it. Um, and even if you could identify them, if the, if the social media companies won't take any action against them, uh, then um, that, that can be meaningless. So I think this is a, this is a new, new challenge and is, is really important. And I, again, I think one of the key issues at the heart of the debate on online harms has got to be, we can say that um, we, can, we can understand harmful disinformation can be when it poses imminent and more immediate physical threat to an individual person. Uh, um, and, and indeed that tension has always been there with speech, the people's right to speak but versus the, the harm that speech can cause other people. There could be this other group though, is to say, are there times when, um, when dis disinformation can be harmful to society, to democracy, and to, to public institutions, and, and therefore what action should be taken at that point? Thank you. Helen, did you want to come in? Yeah, um, I mean, I, 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 I don't know if I do totally agree there because, because the thing is, the traditional media and social media are sort of so intertwined now. Um, they're so kind of interdependent. And I wonder if we have got to sort of 
think a bit about that. I mean, because quite often news articles do almost become kind of dislocated from their actual origin um, and circulated at enormous scale. And perhaps there is an argument for sort of thinking about some aspects of them in the same way that we think about about social media because inevitably they're going to share some of the characteristics there was another question in the q a about kind of local associations um, and facebook groups and things like that which become sort of shady um, campaign organizations um, and you know it, you've got to think about it both ways when when kind of activity on social media sort of grows into more like a sort of organization thing and then where um traditional media organizations um information that they're putting out becomes sort of taken over by another organization um the role of talk radio also for example is another example of that i mean i think i i i wonder if we do i i don't think it is enough to say we can just leave things be they're they're okay um because they do form the heart of uh, campaigns I, d I don't know things like um certain activities online if there's an image in the daily mail about um hanging judges or something like that then that does sort of form part of a political campaign online which which perhaps does need looking at so we've had a couple of questions coming about who should be regulating in this space and, and who should be responsible. And um, so a question from Eunice um, saying, you know, do we need a new regulator to tackle social media as a whole, or should it be the responsibility of an existing um, regulator like Ofcom? And then related to that, a question from Catherine Knox also saying, you know, what about this debate in the context of um, a threats from the, some members of the government about the future of the Electoral Commission and actually is there a job to be doing to maintain the existing infrastructure that we've got as well as thinking about these um, potential new bodies that we might need. Louise it may be a bit unfair to come to you on that but I wonder if you have any thoughts on, uh, on who should be regulating this space. Well I think this comes back to the issue of complexity and the issue that it covers so many different actors and I, I appreciate the point that it can sometimes feel like one regulator is saying, no, 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 that, that's not us. But I think actually what a lot of regulators are saying, well, that bit is us, but that bit is not. So if you take our role, we are fundamentally the regulator of political finance. Our remit goes a little bit further than that. For example, the imprints that we've been talking about, um, we can investigate, we can find if a party or a campaigner doesn't put an imprint on its printed campaign material. But fundamentally, we're a financial regulator and we're about the transparency of finances. That's what Parliament has asked us to do. Um, and there will be other regulators, for example, the Information Commissioner's Office, who will look at the data side of it. So I think it's, it's not so much for me about suggesting that, that no regulator wants this role or that one regulator wants it all. It comes down to how well do the regulators work together. Over the last, I mean, I've been at the Electoral Commission now for, gosh, more than five years. Uh, and our communications with other regulators have improved and increased over that time, not all down to me, um, but we see ourselves very much as a community of regulators who work in this area, and that is increasing all the time. And I think that's the way to, to tackle this issue, is to look at it as a collective group of regulators working together in their own areas. What you bring there are the niche specialisms of each independent regulator and you don't lose them by trying to sort of create a new entity that, that's going to try and do all that work together. Thank you so much. Damien, did you have anything else to add to that? Um, yeah, I think we should probably work with the existing regulators that we have. Um, and uh, I think we need an independent electoral commission. Um, then that should be the, the primary arbiter of election law and election finance regulation with um, with, con with social media, I mean, I think it's very difficult to say with be it social media or the internet as a whole, that we should have an internet regulator because it almost pretends like it's one discrete thing. And I think if you think of um, you know, tele broadcast media, as I think it's a good, good demonstration of this, it would be odd if we said, well, um, you know, the Ofcom regulates the traditional broadcasters, but it's got no role over social broadcasting through social media. 
when as far as the as far as the, the, the viewer is concerned their favorite youtuber is just as much television as bbc one is and they and they watch it through the same smart device um, uh, and so to have like two regulators in that environment would seem odd so i think I think it's right that we should say, well, actually, Ofcom's role is really as a content moderator in this space. We'll look at things outside of elections, but we'll, we'll look at, um, we'll be the regulator for online harms. Um, the Electoral Commission has a particular role in terms of electoral law. The ICO has a particular role in terms of data usage, but obviously we want those, those bodies to work closely together. So for me, that would be the best way forward. And as, we, as everyone knows, creating new regulators inevitably takes a lot of time. Uh, and, you know, I think we've spent, there are already some of these things we desperately need to get on with now, so I'd get on with it with the existing structures. Thank you, Damien. So we've got a, a question from um, Peter D. He says, in terms of regulation of social media platforms, is it fair to solely blame these companies for the issues of today? Be it hate speech, disinformation, propaganda, etc. These platforms are not a paid for service. Is it not more appropriate to use a similar a similar regulatory approach as it would to be in journalism or broadcasting? So has anyone got any thoughts on that? Helen, perhaps I could uh, go to you. Um, yes, well, they are they are private spaces, just as um, uh, many media outlets are. So, um, I mean, I agree with that, but I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, this is a really kind of um, hugely kind of technical task that we're, talk, we're talking about, as well as legal and regulatory tools. I mean, um, it's, it's an area where we, we should be forcing them to innovate, if you like. I mean, uh, for example, um, I don't know, un until recently, quite a small proportion of um, Facebook kind of, of Facebook's tackling of hate was done by actual human content moderators. Um, now it's more like in the 80% 80, 80 or, or, or so is done automatically. But still, all the most kind of difficult problems are dealt with by human um, content moderators. Um, and it transpired at the beginning of the um, pandemic that there wasn't any facility for those people to kind of work at home. Um, so it caused a, in, enormous kind of uh, a disruption. And we should really be thinking about, you, you know, how we incentivize these companies to innovate in the right ways, um, in part by realizing their, their importance. So kind of the status of these companies as some kind of, they're private, but they seem to assume um, in, in the eyes of everyone, some kind of public um, re responsibility. It's a difficult area. We haven't really talked about that, but I think that does need thinking about as well. They are where our public lives play out. They're not going away. Um, and of course, we've seen what, what happens when we you know, going back to the Trump ban, okay, Trump Trump has uh, uh, been banned and many of his supporters have been taken down as well. Um, they've gone somewhere worse, which in itself was taken down, that's parlor. Um, where are they now, you know, in spaces that we really can't see into at all? So I think there is an argument for really thinking about this in a concerted way and kind of trying to uh, uh, sorry to go back to the same point, but sort of working with those companies as really important global actors, um, because otherwise, um, yeah, we could find find ourselves in a in a kind of worse situation with a hugely fragmented um, public sphere. If, if I could add, add on that, I think where I, I think there is a role to look at the social media companies is that um, where it's their business model. Where they're making money uh, out of the, out of decisions that they're making around the amplification of content, then that's something they they should be held to account for, and and there should be some I think some sort of regulatory structures around it as well. Just there is in almost every other industry around around business models and the way people make money. So you know, there was um, you know if they are so there's all they've always been conspiracy theorists and people who with with hate with hateful or hurtful views, and historically. That's not been a problem if if the worst they can do is stand at speaker's corner in Hyde Park and shout, you know, uh, or they can be the person no one wants to talk to on the bus. When when all of a sudden they've got a, there's a media tool that allows the amplification of 
you know, hate and hurtful views and, uh, uh, and conspiracy theories. Uh, and it's not just that that exists um, and it's an organic platform where people follow each other, but actually the platform plays a role in deciding what content on that platform is going to boost, what it's going to amplify. And it does that because it's only in, it's all it's looking at is the audience for it. And it's boosting content based on the audience to make money, to hold people's attention for longer so it can serve more advertising at them and make money from that advertising. Now, where a company is doing that, I think it has a responsibility over what it chooses to, to amplify or not. Because the, the, issue, the issue we have now with things like the Stop the Steal campaign and the insurrection in Washington and the anti-vax movement, it's not, that, it's not that there are people that have got views that, are, that could be harmful to others. It's that actually those views are being shared on a platform which is boosting and amplifying those views in order to, in order to make money. Because that's, that's what the system has been designed to do. It wasn't necessarily designed with that sort of content in mind. No, but, but nevertheless, that is a, this is a byproduct of the way they've designed their systems. So the challenge to those companies, which, you know, because I think it's so fundamental to the way their businesses work is one they've not wanted to pick up, is that actually this is where this is where regulations come in. And this idea of you being treated in a special way has come in is because it's something fundamental about the way you work and the way you make money out of your users uh, that that needs to be addressed uh, and, it, and is now causing a massive disruption to, to society. So. I think, and I think the the stat that was I've referred to people have heard me speak about this before. Will have heard me use many times before. Is you know, but a good illustration of the report Facebook did looking at um, hate speech in Germany in 2016, which the company was leaked this year, but sorry, leaked last year. The company hadn't published previously, where where it said that 60 percent of people that joined groups on Facebook that were sharing hate speech um, did so at Facebook's recommendation. That, that that is the kind of that, 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 that and that is I think perfectly just for us to say that that's a problem you know and we, we want to know what you're doing about that and we want some way of knowing that you are effectively dealing with that you know, um. yeah very good. if I could just jump in there I absolutely agree with that and that's what I was talking that's why I was talking about friction earlier um, the, it, there've been quite a lot of developments that in recent years and we really need more of that this question of you know, not 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 treating it as binary because, as you say, if it's just one person, and that is true because of the way the internet works, that is true that the vast majority of this stuff is the equivalent of the person shouting in Hyde Park Corner. Um, but it's it's the question of of making sure that it doesn't turn into something massive, um, and friction is the way to do that, and that's where they need to be directing innovation. I I totally agree. Mm. Really interesting point. So we've had two questions from Ravi, um, Ravi Knight, who's a, a leading lawyer working on data. So I'm going to take the first one first, which is um, about how, however, would we define politics to ensure effective regulation? I think this is something Louise was mentioning, you know, there isn't a clear definition of what is a political advert. So Louise, do you have any thoughts on how we do define politics to regulate in this space? Another nice easy one. Thank you very much. Um, so earlier on, I can't remember who it was who mentioned the fact that, that the law currently thinks about campaigning in the run up to elections. There's this period before an election where campaigning is done and there are rules around it, like a spending limit on it and so forth. And, and in that area, you can define it. And indeed, the law does define it as uh, campaign spending. And there's a fair amount of fairly complicated uh, law around what is and is not campaign spending. Um, so you can define campaign spending in that way. There's also a separate definition in law, which is about material which is designed to uh, promote or procure a particular outcome at an election. So basically try and persuade you to vote for one party or not to vote for a different party. And that's defined as well. So I think the way to approach it is actually to understand which bit of politics it is that you're trying to define um, and then come up with a definition in that area. But I do agree with what I think is the sentiment there, that when you move beyond these definitions into something like political campaigning, that is a very, very difficult thing to define. I mean, politics is a discourse. It can be a discussion. It can be anything. So I think really you have to try and break it down into the particular areas that you're interested in. If I, if I could add on that as well, I don't think you can, I, I think going back to the debate on, the wider debate on where this, political disinformation sits within the online harms agreement as well. You can't, you can't regulate political speech you know, because you know, as everyone will know, two politicians can quote 
totally valid statistics to give diametrically opposite interpretations of the same event. You know, so uh, based on their own views uh, and and therefore you know, people may disagree with, and people may disagree with that violently, but that's that's part of debate. I think where where the regulator where there's I think as Louise has set out, there are de there are existing definitions around what we think political campaigning is and what should and shouldn't be covered. And then beyond that, I think it's looking at um, of, of, of sort of disinformation that we know is absolute lies. You know, either it's a deep fake film that we know is totally fabricated, it's portraying someone saying something they never said in, 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 to damage them uh, or, to, or other people. Um, it's, you know, it's fake footage of an event. Uh, it is an assertion of, of, of something that has never happened or, or for which there is no evidence. And, or, an, you know, or, or kind of an, an incitement for people to behave in a violent or aggressive way. And that's and that that, that sort of speech can happen within a political context, but I think, but it's more saying actually it's it's that sort of behaviour across the board that we want to see action against. And even if that is, uh, and it's not an excuse to say just because it's happened in the context of a political ad or a political film or a political channel that somehow it's exempt. Yeah, an excellent point. So I'm going to ask one last question, which links together the second part of uh, the question that Ravi asked about. You know, are party is actually doing anything themselves to crack down on, on um, the kind of profiling, especially around ethnicity that um, his research found evidence of. But I also want to link that to a question from Ricky Dean, which is, you know, saying in the context of, of the fact that we know that campaigners are um, using some negative practice, you know, are there good ways to increase the penalties for political actors who spread misinformation? And what are those? So I'll give each of the three of you a chance to respond to that and then we will wrap up. Uh, Helen, I don't know if you want to kick off. Well, it, it links to the previous question, really, a qu question of definition. I mean, I think we're gonna have to broaden what we think of as politics. Um, we have had a, an idea of politics, which is something very sort of institution based, um, you know, parties kind of rather na narrowly defined um, elections um, instead of sort of campaigning o o o all the time. Um, and we're going to have to accept that those definitions have to be broadened. Now, of course, politics is about institutions, but and it's also about people. Um, and so in, in relation to that point, you know, we've got to think about what people are doing and whether, you know, in the more absolute sense, as Damien was saying, whether it is out and out lies or whether it is abuse or whether it is harming somebody. Um, and I think we're going to have to tackle it that way. Thank you, Helen. Louise? Oh, I'm not sure you're unmuted, Louise. There we go. Apologies. Um, I think you were right that it, it, it's not just about uh, political parties. It's about broader institutions, organisations, individuals who do want to campaign um, and about making sure that uh, they have a way of demonstrating the integrity of the campaigns that they run from their finances to how they handle data. And it's about demonstrating that integrity that I think if you're a legitimate political actor, you'd be very happy to do. Um, and indeed, I would say that there is a really good culture of compliance in this country. Broadly speaking, our regulated community, political parties and other campaigners, they do want to comply. They do try to comply. We work very well with political parties and campaigners to comply with the laws that we regulate. And I think that's a really good starting point to be. Um, in terms of increasing penalties, first of all, you know, enforcement has to be something that you get to if you can't persuade or incentivize people to put good compliance processes in from the outset. So I wouldn't want to jump straight to having bigger or more severe penalties, but I think there's a real incentivization for people to invest in their compliance teams and their compliance processes if they know that if something does go wrong, it will get found out. Whether that leads to a penalty or not is something different, but it's about being confident that the laws are being enforced robustly um, and we do think that that means higher penalties in our regime, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we suddenly want to fine everybody millions of pounds. It is actually about trying to incentivize really good investment in compliance from the outset and demonstrating the integrity of the campaign that you're running. Thank you, really good points. And finally, Damien. Um, thank you. I think, um, 
as Louise has said, the political parties, I think, on the whole, seek to comply with regulation because you know, there is jeopardy in that. Political parties make mistakes during campaigns. They, you know, they run ads which, which they wish they hadn't run or they say things they wish they hadn't said. And, but there's a jeopardy for them when they do that because it's traceable. It's, a, it's, it's, it's easy, to, it can be traced back to them. And therefore, you know, they, one of the best ways of, of getting an organization to moderate its behavior is if, they, if it's, it's gonna be held to account for it you know, because, because it can't hide it. That the harder area has become, and this is, um, and this is something that I think has existed in America for a long time, but has become more of a factor here, whereas you can have quite big voices in the political debates where either we don't really know who they are at all, or um, they sit sort of outside of the party structures, and yet they are they're in, uh, they're influential, and they they spring up and they go away again, and they can for a period of time be quite big voices in a in a movement. And there, I think you know that's you know, social media has made that has made it's made that possible at a scale that we've never really seen before because the the cost of entry of trying to get a message going or an organisation going to reach a lot of people very quickly was was very high, but now it's not very high at all, and so that's why I think I think in terms of you know the, the, what we've discussed in terms of regulations for campaigns, I think it's easy to get the parties to comply with that. Where we need the help of the social media companies is to say, well, at what point do we intervene if we've got we want to investigate something that's going on on their platforms that we think the electoral commission should be able to see, you know, or understand what's going on. We need to find out more about because it's the it's the sort of wild west area of this which is the the hardest to police. Well, I want to thank, first of all, all of our speakers for three absolutely fascinating um, presentations and, and contributions to the discussion, but also for the comments and questions that you sent in and apologies we weren't able to get through all of those. Um, so you'll be able to find a, a video version of this event available online at the Political Quarterly blog after this, and it'll be tweeted about on Twitter. I'd also once again just encourage you to go and have a look at that freely accessible copy of the special issue devoted to this topic. But once again, just to bring this to a close by thanking all of our three speakers and all of you for participating in this event. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.